Dr. Pawinda Ko, uh, who is an Associate Professor and the Director of DNA Zoo Australia at the Faculty of Sciences uh, in the University of Western Australia. Dr. Pawinda Ko leads an innovative translational, research, uh, translational genomics research program that aims uh, to translate fundamental science into ready-to-use solutions across the agricultural and medical sectors. Her DNA lab team enables research to span the spectrum of scientific activities beyond the traditional lab-to-landscape model using new age technologies such as CRISPR, single cell and 3D genomics. With DNA Zoo Australia, she is on a mission to provide genomic empowerment to unique Australian biodiversity, facilitating conservation efforts for the threatened and endangered species. She has made substantial contributions to the field of biotechnology and was appointed as UWA's Be Inspired for Agricultural and Environmental Biotechnology in 2019. Her studies tracking genomic variation to breed low methanogenic forages in Australia provide a new paradigm for reducing the environmental footprint of ruminants. She has been honoured by the prestigious Science and Innovation Award for Young People in Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestries uh, by the Australian Academy of Sciences in 2013. A joint venture between UWA and the, world, the world's biggest pasture seed company, PGG Rats and Seeds, resulted in demonstrating the impact at the paddock level. Uh, also, DNA Zoo's innovative work developments won the Microsoft AIs for Earth Award for 2019 to 2020. We are happy to have her with us today. Today, I would like to take you guys on a little journey here with me. Um, and before we get started on that journey, um, I would like to sh share with you guys the location where we are based. So I'm not sure how many of you know about Perth in Western Australia. So here, this little golden dot on the Australian map, that's exactly where Perth is located. We are one of the top 10 healthiest cities in the world. Uh, very well positioned in terms of, you know, the, the audience I'm connecting to today. It's only two and a half hours of uh, time difference with India. Um, and it's also considered as one of Australia's one of the most affordable capital cities and uh, one of the largest number of ASX listed companies uh, have headquarters here in Perth. So I hope that you guys have heard about Perth before. Um, and also there's, uh, there's some special benefits of uh, students who are thinking to come to Western Australia to do their uh, higher studies or undergrad because there's a uh, there is a provision of regional status uh, in this part of the world, uh, which you can apply your permanent residency and other things. Um, so this is this is uh, where I am right now. So this building here, you see, this is the Bayless building and this is the building where I am sitting. This is our Crowley campus. Uh, this is the Perth city. And this is the beautiful Span River around which uh, the whole Perth is um, based around. We are ranked number one in Australia and 17th in the world for agricultural sciences. And that was one of the reasons that I came here uh, to do my PhD studies in 2007. Um, we have one of the biggest in-city parks, which is Kings Park, with enormous amounts of biodiversity out there. Um, and there's also a huge health campus, which is located uh, across, on, on the Crawley campus as well. Um, and we have on-campus hotels and everything, if you're thinking. And there are a lot of scholarships which are being offered at UWA. So if you are considering, then um, I would suggest that you please go and visit the uwa.edu.au Study Global Excellence Scholarship website, and you should be able to find further information in there. Um, before I get started, I would like to acknowledge um, that this campus from where I'm talking to you and where we do all this wonderful work, which I will be sharing with you guys today, is situated on Noongar land and the Noongar people remain the spiritual and cultural custodians of their land and continue to practice their values, languages, beliefs, and knowledge. So I'm sure 
if you've been if you're studying agriculture or you you excited about biotechnology and the scope of agriculture the one of the key reasons which the entire world is thinking right now is going from population um what we have right now to a 9 billion or 10 billion estimated to be in 2050 so this there is a population challenge going on apart from all the other challenges which it has created like the climate challenge um, the challenge of limited resources and it can keep going and right now the biggest challenge which we are facing the covid challenge so how are we going to deal with this and where are we headed and how different technologies or specifically biotechnology is going to help us in getting there or having a better and sustainable future so as we know future demand for food is going to increase by 70% in 2050 as we rise as the population rises as per the world resources um institute so how are we going to put that food on the plate especially when there is a scenario like normanny warlock very well said that when there is a there is a you know resource restriction you cannot build a peaceful world on empty stomachs and human misery and that is very very correct and we are seeing that those challenges very very closely right now during the pandemic which we are facing that how the economy is crashing how the things because of the lockdown you know it's 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 kind of we are living that what we were hoping to be in 2050 it's kind of like come to us a little bit earlier uh, so i think it's time that we we all get together and reflect on how things are going to be and uh, where thing where things are leading to so i'm a i'm a firm believer um, as you can see that a lot of my work is on biodiversity and natural natural germ plasm resources using using what nature has provided us and nature while there are a lot of problems which we are facing a lot of them are man man made i would say or human created problems because we've been a little selfish i would say i mean we've occupied 96% of this planet and we are just one species out of the billions of species who also co inhabit this planet with us so is that is that the right thing to do we haven't left you know even the even out of the 4% we've left for the other species we're trying to domesticate the 3% um of the of of that amount as well we're leaving just 1% for the wild and when we leave in such limited resource for the other species to survive and thrive we're breaking the food chain we're breaking the entire system in there and that is causing troubles and you know we are in one right now we are in a pandemic and without going too much into the details of that i would just want to my key message today is that nature has solutions we just got to go out there and look for those solutions and really listen closely that what what is what should be the way forward in the future so as we talk about solutions uh, we we have about 17 countries which are the bio, which has got the biological hotspot biodiversity hotspots um and i'm very very fortunate to be sitting in one of that uh, global hotspot which which is actually the the world's first identified biodiversity hotspot for southwest australia and how we using that to our advantage here will be reflected um uh, in the case studies which i will be showing you guys and that was actually the key reason for me to come to come to western australia to do my phd because i think that when nature has provided us solutions we really need to go and and explore carefully those solutions and using non model species has been uh, my passion because i think we got to go find the solutions of chase the problem where the problem is rather than trying to do research with lab rats or in plant world we do all that research with the gametopsis i'm not saying it's not useful it's very very useful it's a good starting point but having said that there's a technological revolution which is actually enabling us to be able to even go further down the track so why not so as i said western australia it's it has beauty which is very rich and rare and southwest region has the diversity at its greatest we've got amazing amazing native plants uh, which are 
which found some really uh, fascinating ways, fascinating root systems to sort of drive uh, nutrients from the soil, which are one of the world's poorest nu nutrient poorest soils. So all these, um, all these things are very fascinating uh, to study and also explore. But what has happened is like being a molecular biologist, I think that whatever you see in terms of a phenotype, whatever is visual to our eyes has always got a mechanism or a molecular um, mechanism underneath that. And I, I really get fascinated and I'm very passionate to find that because once you know those, those mechanisms, you, you actually get to think about the solutions um, or to chase those solutions uh, in a much more fast way. And that's where the genomic resources come into play. But unfortunately, we've got, there, there has been, I mean, there is an enormous amount of biodiversity, but we have been just studying a couple of model systems uh, all these years because of the limitations in, in having those genomic resources. And when I talk about genomic resources, and the first thing I'm talking, uh, first thing I, that comes to my mind is actually decoding that entire species or that non-model system at a DNA level. And to be honest with you, the current revolution in next generation sequencing, like going coming from $2.7 billion genome, which was built in 2010 for humans, to nowadays when people are doing like the $100 human genomes, people are doing personalized medicine. So we're doing that for our species, we're doing that for ourselves. But what about the other things, other problems and, and, and finding solutions for that? And that's where, that's what we will be exploring today, that how the reach of the genetics can be extended to feed the world by chasing these non-model systems. And um, my, my host talk was in the subterranean clover, which is, you must have, must have uh, heard about the clovers, or I used to play this game when we were little. Um, chasing the four leaf clover clovers because normally clovers are three leaf and so if it's a four leaf clover like you 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 kind of get lucky that day or something like that i'm not sure how many of you played that game but uh, yeah those those are the clovers i'm talking about and that will be the case uh, case study i would like to present to you guys today so just to introduce you guys to subterranean clover it is one of the key pasture um, it is actually not one, but it is the key pasture uh, legume species in Australia, which is sown about uh, and sown over an area of 29 million hectares. It's a, being a legume, you know, legumes can fix atmospheric nitrogen. They're very, very good for the soil health, but at the same time, they're very good for the animal health being very high quality forage. They've got very, very good uh, source of proteins in them. They, and apart from that, they're able to grow in a diverse uh, rainfall environment, soil types and farming systems. So farmers absolutely love them because they're very, very easy to grow and they're very flexible. Like in terms, they're not very picky about this type of soil, this type of environment, this kind of system I need, you know? So, but apart from that, it's also a very ideal reference species for pastures or, or legumes for doing comparative genomics because it's a diploid system. So it's like only got two copies of every genome, just like, you know, humans does. Uh, it's, it's a small genome, so which is made up of 556 million bases. I know million bases, but still it's, uh, um, if you compare it with the human genome, it's only one sixth the size of the human genome. So a normal human genome is about 3.2 billion um, billion pieces or base pairs use uh, if you want to compare the size of the data and it's predominantly inbreeding so inbreeding means that it crosses with itself so it's when the species are crossbreeding or crossing with other species so every time you cross with other species you bring in the genome of that so it becomes really really uh, complicated. So this one is a, is an easy system. It's readily hybridized, and it has got a range of qualitative and quantitative uh, um, quantitative traits which we could study and identify and match and go from genome to phenome, phenome to genome, etc. Um, and having said that, although we have the biodiversity in the world, but also we were very lucky, or I was very lucky to do my postdoc in this one because. We've got, um, um, we've got the world collection. So University of Western Australia and Department of Agriculture has been collecting these clovers from all over the world. And we've got about 10,000 different accessions which have been collected from the Mediterranean basis, which is kind of the naturalized in, uh, 
places where this clover has been growing. So we've we've um, we've narrowed that down to a, a 97 accessions or 97 um, types, uh, which represents about 80% of the genetic diversity of the species, which is great because every time you're looking for something, you don't need to go and screen 10,000 accessions. You can just screen the 97 and which has kind of all the biodiversity you or the diversity of that species represented in there. So that's that's uh, called a core collection, and core collections are really really useful, um, useful resources for which has been developed for many different species these days. Um, and then we also added some elite Australian cultivars, about 28, because they've they they've been doing really well in Australia. So it was if we wanted to capture the entire sort of uh, panel, so we call this uh, call this a diversity panel uh, for developing our pan genome. So when I started working, I did I I went and developed looked at many different sequencing methods which involve long reads, short reads, or medium-sized reads, and then combining them together to kind of like read the entire genome in in detail. But there's lots of challenges to get genomes together. It's not that easy to read all those 550 billion a million bases correctly throughout and a lot of uh, even after going through like many iterations we were still sitting at a reference genome which was published in 2017 which still had gaps and inversions and many different problems um, because of which i was not able to connect i was not able to connect the dots perfectly um, so normally like um, uh, we did capture 95% of the genome and it's called a gold rap, a gold standard reference, but I was really chasing like a perfect and I was just, I, I just wanted to have it like have the whole thing in one place. Uh, the, how can we uh, answer some complex traits or complex questions if you don't have the full information. So that is when I met, um, sorry. So what, what I mean from pieces is like normally when we read all those technologies which I'm showing you, we end up getting lots and lots and lots of those reads and we call them contigs or short contigs in, in our language in bioinformatics. But we normally what we're chasing for is like clear chromosomes, you know, so that you can say, okay, I found this particular, you know, these plants have got really long root hairs and this is the chromosome where it actually, the, the, the gene for that long root hairs is situated and this is how it is interacting with the rest of the genome and things like that. But we're only able to do that um, if we got pieces like this. If we got millions of pieces like this, um, yes, it is useful, but maybe not that useful. So what happens is when we do that, we try to order and orient that by using linking data by different technologies, as I said, long reads, short reads, but that becomes a very, very expensive affair. And it's, it's different technologies, different kind of expertise. Um, similar way the human genome was done, which was about $2.7 billion, uh, the whole world united to get that together. But we can't spend $2.7 billion on every species on the planet, right? So so what do we do? So there is this um, team um, at Baylor College of Medicine at the Center for Genome Architecture, Professor Eris Aidan Lieberman. He invented HiC. HiC is a really, really cool way of generating linking information. And that, um, I got really excited when I listened to his talk in 2015 and I had an opportunity to go to his lab and and use that technology on the clovers, on my um, little clover plants. And we had an amazing uh, time, but having said that, also a very, very productive uh, clover genome assembly in three dimensions. So just to um, take you guys very briefly through the HiC protocol, what HiC does is it gives you the genome in a three dimension. And originally it was invented to understand the genome architecture or the folding patterns. Because I'm, I don't know if how many of you know, uh, on an average, the nuclear size is about six microns in human. Okay, and it's fitting in three billion base pairs in just that six micron nucleus. How it is doing that? And, and 
For doing that, it has to actually fold in certain ways so that the information is transcribed and translated through all the mechanisms which we know. And it's very specific and that's how we kind of, you know, function and look and we our phenotypes are visible. So what HiC does is you take a snapshot of that particular contact or those contacts which the loci are making in that six micronucleus. And once you know that, you kind of uh, take a snapshot of that using a, a process called cross-linking DNA, which we use about 2% formaldehyde to do that. And then you cut it with restriction enzymes, which are the biological pair of scissors used. Um, then you kind of stick that together uh, using biotin, you ligate them, and then you just pull, you know, Pull, pull it through those, those contact matrices and then sequence them using paired and sequencing on high, um, high throughput sequencing platforms like Illumina is one of the very, very common, commonly used platform. So, and then how you analyze that data is inspired by Facebook contact mappings. Uh, so I'm sure a lot of you use Facebook and post your photos. Sometimes Facebook even comes back to you, not just with your memories these days, but also kind of suggest relationships with the person you posted maximum number of photos. And that's, that's called orthogonal approach and contact mapping. And that's exactly what we use to map uh, genomes or when I would say, to build a Facebook of genomes. Okay, so I'm gonna give you an example of Homer Simpson's Facebook page. Let's, uh, let's go through all his photos and see if we can, uh, we can do some orthogonal mapping using his, uh, his Facebook page. So what are you gonna see these days? Selfie trends, we're gonna see lots and lots of uh, selfies there of Homer himself. Uh, some of his photos with his wife Marge, his kids, Bat, Lisa and Maggie, of course, you're going to see Flanders, his neighbors in there, and a lot of other contacts which he kind of hang out with or come in, interact, come in contact with. So all these photos, what we're going to do is we're going to build a symmetrical matrix out of that. So by symmetrical matrix, I mean, let's put all the characters who you see in the photos as x-axis and y-axis, exactly the same order. And then we're going to assign a small a number, the number that how many times that contact um, appeared in a photo together. Okay, and then we overlay that with um, with um, a heat map. So the bigger the number, the darker the heat map color goes. And all of a sudden, I'm seeing this little enriched square in the middle. So what does that mean? That's um, Let's look at what does that mean. So that has got, wow, that's got the family in there. That's interesting, isn't it? So you all of a sudden you get an enrichment square which describe, which shows the family structure of this uh, particular contact matrix which we map. So basically the hypothesis here is which, which is being used that the people who kind of closer to each other or kind of live together or, or are together are going to bump or are bump into each other more or are going to be in contact with each, with each other at a much higher frequency than the people they live away from. And same happens in the genomes. So if this is a chromosome and there's about, you know, many chromosomes in particular species, for example, humans have got 26, chromo 26 chromosomes and then you've got the other one and we do this and this is a high C map for a human genome. And these little squares where you see enriched squares are your chromosomes. So it, am I making sense? Like for example, if you are a low size sitting on the same chromosome, you're gonna have, uh, you're gonna bump into each other much often than a low size sitting on different chromosomes. So just by using that approach, you're able to filter out or you're able to visualize or bring the chromosomes together. Bingo, problem solved. It's a long standing challenge in the genomics to be able to pull together chromosome level assemblies. And I showed you that how in Clovers I went around the world, used all the technologies, poured in a lot of money, but still was not able to get a chromosome length genome. Here we go. The first species we did was a very close relative model species for legumes, which is um, Medicago truncatilla. And we were able to pull together the eight neat chromosomes from a very um, like, you know, fragmented assembly. 
And same thing was when I applied that to clovers. This was my, I mean, this was a gold standard genome. Look at that. We're not able to deduce any structure here. Whereas here you got neat eight chromosomes, which um, a chromosome length assembly. It's it's beautiful. And now I can I can start to sort of you know, link other forms of data which we were collecting on clovers with this genome assembly and trying to start answering questions. And this this was really wonderful. And um, and I would like to sh like share with you guys. And this is the basic principle behind DNA Zoo. DNA Zoo is uh, found, was founded by Professor Erizid Leberman from Bella College of Medicine. Uh, and we've got satellite branches all over the world for that now. We've 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 sequenced. 150 plus genomes. It's only um, it's less than two years since uh, DNA Zoo was founded on uh, 2nd of November 2018, and we are here August 2020. And this many number of genomes have already been released. Chromosome length, all open source. So if you get a chance, please go and visit the DNA Zoo website and have a look uh, at many different examples. Uh, of using that contact matrices. Um, moving on, so how how we use that information? So as I said, nature has solutions, and nature has all this. By